Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Budget and Finance Committee f meeting for Monday, November 27th, 2017. Uh, I'm Paul Krikorian, Chair of the Committee, We're joined by my colleagues, Mr. Bonin and Mr. Blumenfield, and we are ready to begin. Um, members, I would have proposed items 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 uh, for consent approval, uh, but I we do have uh, cards on some of those, so um, we'll hold, hold those on the desk for the moment. I'm going to ask that we take, uh, because of uh, court scheduling needs, I'm going to ask that we take item five out of order. Five? Item five out of order and uh, go into closed session for that matter, and then we'll come back in uh, and conclude the rest of our agenda. But we'll, so that you can all be comfortable here. We'll take closed session in the back. But, Mr. Marion, I do have one comment card on item number five, so I'd like to call up Mr. Spindler for one minute. Yes. And thank you so much, Council, for suing the city. And we need more of this. Los Angeles Police Department, everything they do, they're guilty. Every single allegation by the plaintiff is true. The LAPD is a terrorist organization. They have a de facto system of repression. I was just at the LA County Law Library meeting of agenda. There's four superior court judges. I discussed it with them that the LAPD needs a new federal consent degree. Please push for a federal consent degree because the LAPD is still acting worse than they did before they beat the hell out of that poor Rodney King and took everybody for a ride downtown. So again, I appreciate it. I think punitive damages are appropriate and I think punitive damages against the chief of police is appropriate. Kick ass council and thank you for suing the city. God bless. All right. Uh, the that's the only card that we have on item Correct. number five, I believe, so we'll go ahead now and uh, recess into closed session, uh, which we will take in the other room. We'll be back. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. We are now uh, back in open session, and uh, we will, we're ready to proceed with the meeting. Uh, members, again, um, Mr. Herman, you can get dressed in the hallway. Um, please, so that you don't disrupt the meeting. All right, so uh, members, I had offered uh, numbers 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13 for consent approval, uh, but we do have cards from Mr. Spindler and Mr. Herman on all of those matters. So Mr. Spindler, you have one minute left, followed by Mr. Herman's two minutes on all matters. So as you see, we get one fucking minute to cover all the remaining items of a 13-item agenda. But again, to all the attorneys here, thank you again for suing the city and bending over Paul Krikorian and giving it to him in the ass back there in closed session. It's very much appreciated because these people up here are the most degenerate scumbags you've ever seen in a municipal corporation. So item number one, city's guilty. Item number two, Guilty, guilty, city, guilty. Item number three, guilty. Strip and fall. Guilty, guilty, guilty. And that's in CD5. Shame on Paul Krikorian and Paul Koretz. <coughs> Respectively. And then Dennis Gabir versus City of Los Angeles. Thank you again for suing the city. Another out of control bicycle accident. Fuck the city. Keep suing the city. Thank you. Mr. Herman, two minutes. For the record, fuck you. 42 USC Speak 1983, the Willits versus Speak the, the city of, items of Los Angeles on a trip and fall accident on item three, fuck you. Item four, bicycle accident, where? In North Vigil, fuck you too. Then I go to item five, Fuck the police, NWA style. Fuck all white niggers who fuck children. You fucking disgraceful, pitiful motherfuckers sleeping with children. And then I go into number 666, employment discrimination. 
I know what the fuck discrimination is like. I've been unemployed since 2008. I know what the fuck discrimination is all about and retaliation. Once again, for the record, fuck all you white, stupid motherfucking idiots for discrimination on the job and sexual harassment, sexual misconduct. Fuck you. General public comment. No, you're not. I got one minute, fool. No, you can General you can public speak comment. The agenda item I am. Done. The truth is, you have to pay all these lawyers for the shit you do, all your stupid fucking friend lawyers that you hire for all this outside resettlement council. I know what the fuck it's all about. It's all about the Jewish money going to waste because Herman West and Jason, white nigger racist, rather it's put motherfuckers, pay them morning. up, pay them up, and you don't do nothing about Woods versus Los Angeles. I've been disabled because of a physical and another type of disability, and you white motherfuckers don't fix the fucking streets. People are sick and paying 12%, Jerry Brown. Fuck you too. And to all those fucking pedophiles in LA, okay, especially you're off, you're LAPD, you're you're stop done. fucking He's children, done. you stupid He's motherfuckers. He's if he keeps talking, I got 11 down. seconds. Okay, yeah. take him out. He's disrupting the meeting. 10 seconds left. You're, you're continuing to disrupt the meeting. See you later. And as Mr. Herman is leaving, for all the members of the audience who are here to talk about real matters and petition their government consistent with your rights, I apologize to all of you. Mr. Herman, get out, Mr. Herman. I apologize to everyone who's here to actually conduct the city's business with their city council. Um, it's a regrettable thing that some members of the public decide to abuse their rights by coming here and um, being offensive to just about every civilized uh, way of uh, thinking or speaking. So um, I, again, I apologize to all of you who are coming here to do actual work. So. Um, with that, members, we've, take, we've exhausted public comment on items 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And if there is no objection uh, to approving items 9, 10, 11, and 13, and noting and filing item number 12, uh, it will be the action of the committee uh, to do so, seeing no objection. So those items are dealt with. And then we will go ahead and start with item number Eight, and we'll begin uh, comment on item number eight. So we have a substantial amount of comment on that matter. We'll start with Michelle Milner, followed by Carol Kravitz, followed by Madeline Merritt. I Come on up, and each of you will have one minute. James, Office of Finance report relative to general banking services request for proposal. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, um, City Council members. My name is Michelle Milner, and I'm speaking on behalf of Divest LA. Um, I just want to take a moment and step back. We, we came to this because we care about our home, which is the planet, and we care about preserving it. The destruction that happens to the environment is financed by the banks. So we, we're trying to bring a higher level of consciousness to the banks, and one way to do that is through their dealings with the city. We looked very specifically at what the Office of Finance proposed for their um, point system. It looks really good. We have a couple of suggestions. Um, one of them is that we include an environmental and indigenous people's justice section on the social responsibility part that would be worth 10 points. Um, hopefully all of you have received this by email, and certainly we tried to drop it off at everyone's offices. It's in green, so that would be another section to consider. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Carol Kravitz, followed by Madeline Merritt, followed by Aparna. Sorry. You know, I had the same problem last time. <laughs> I apologize. But my, my error. Okay, go right ahead. I'm Carol Kravitz. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as, as Michelle said, Divest LA has always been in the mind of 
uh, providing solutions orient oriented advocacy. And in this light, we've determined that the, to adopt the environmental, social, and governance, the ESC policies in, in your updated RFP is, will bring it in line with the city's values and goals. To that end, we support the finance department's proposal for the alternative scoring system with some of the um, additions that Michelle mentioned. The third point would be the environmental and indig indigenous peoples um, uh, policy for 10 points. And the respondents have to have a 15 point uh, minimum in order to be considered to move on to phase three. Now the policy, the ESG policy could be monitored by third party entity and, uh, but, and we think the internal city evaluation panel that recommends, doesn't recommend laying out the scores, it, it, it's a little, uh, it contradicts itself a little bit. And I'd like to see how we are actually going to supply the social responsibility aspect of it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Madeline Merritt, followed by Apar Aparna Bakali, right? Sorry, I don't know why I had... Followed by Trinity Tran. Okay. Hello, um, thanks for ha letting me speak today. You're also um, uh, on with an international audience of environmentalists who really care about this issue. So. Uh, we appreciate that there's many people out there who care about what the city of Los Angeles does and the opportunity for this city to be a true leader um, globally through truly protecting our environment by creating standards that the banks um, do business with us. You know, getting that public option of being able to choose which banks we do business with is a huge step forward in um, our potential as a public to affect their policies which are hurting our planet and our people. Um, if we really want to be a city that represents its constituents, which protects our environment and looks towards our future um, in terms of our activities today and the coming generations, this is a huge step forward. And so we really appreciate um, all of your efforts to learn more about this issue and what you can do on behalf of it. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker is Aparna Bakali, followed by Trinity Tran, followed by Georgette Sharp. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, honorable council members. Once again, we find ourselves before you to advocate on behalf of socially responsible banking. Divest LA has a relatively simple proposal to evaluate the banks or a third party rating system that could be used. Over the weekend, um, the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau was in the news, um, and constitutional lawyer Lawrence Tribe indicated that we're at constitutional crisis level. So it's incumbent upon our city leaders and municipal government to make sure that banks know that they have a choice on whether or not to finance destructive environmental projects that harm us all, but particularly indigenous, people, indigenous peoples and nations. The city, we hope, would choose banks that do the most good and the least harm. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Trinity Tran, followed by Georgette Sharp, followed by Mrs. Beverly Roberts. Good afternoon. Divest LA thanks the Committee in Finance for your continued commitment to creating greater banking accountability. We're supportive of Finance's alternative scoring system as it gives greater, greater consideration for social responsibility. However, we're proposing a restructure of the 30-point scoring system as follows. Ten, 10 points towards enforcement actions, 10 points towards community lending, investing in banking services to include sales goals disclosure, and 10 points for the city to rank a bank's performance with ESG, environmental, social, and government scores from a third party agency or through an internal valuation panel that weighs a financial institution's environmental score. Um, in accordance with Mayor Garcetti's sustainability city plan, the city's banking institutions must reflect the city's commitment to environmental sustainability and not undermine it. Therefore, qualified bidders on our RFP should be weighted on their environmental and climate implementation score. In 2016, the city passed a no dapple resolution to support legislation and actions that uphold the, uphold the rights of Standing Rock Sioux Tribe to protect their sovereign resources. So in closing, the city must ensure that environmental issues are significantly weighed and addressed in our banking policies. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, our next speaker is Georgette Sharp. Followed My name by is Georgette Sharp. I represent Better Banks. Remember Charles Keating, CEO of Lincoln Savings and Loan, invoked predatory sales goals when he defrauded 23,000 white wealthy investors and white big money depositors out of $250 million. Keating was found guilty of 73 counts, and 42 of those counts were considered fraud. He served jail times for crimes against affluent whites. Yet Wells Fargo had 3.5 million fraud accounts with predatory sales goals, but no one at Wells Fargo went to jail. So why is it so difficult to find verbiage for Wells Fargo predatory sales goals violation? Lincoln Savings Loan and Wells Fargo, other big banks all have a common link of duplicity, criminal acts. When it is white on white crime, you go to jail, but white on color crime for predatory sales goals, a solution must be found and allow banks to conduct business as usual. How much more proof do you need? Uh, legisl you legislators have the power to do business, you have the power to know who you do business with and how much more proof do you need and remember that justice is, is now colorblind. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Beverly Roberts, followed by Maria Loya, followed by Oreño Opinaldo. Greetings, Councilman. Um, I have solutions. RBO, we are asking that the RBO get delayed to give uh, the council more time to consider and um, discuss ways to strengthen the ordinance to improve transparency and incorporate new standards for consumer protection. My next one is RPF, I mean RFP. We are asking that the RFP require that banks disclose how their sales goals are structured and implemented. With this requirement, the city will ensure that there is transparency in how the banks provide their products and services for cons consumers. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Loya, followed by Orino Pinaldo, followed by Patrick Smith. Good afternoon. Um, as you know, uh, Committee for Better Banks and ACE has been addressing the issue of sales goals and the impact that it, it has had uh, throughout the country. Uh, what we'd like to ask within the request for proposal is that uh, that banks be required to disclose their employee incentive program that includes sales goals. Um, we feel uh, that this request is not unreasonable, and considering uh, the practice, uh, considering what Wells Fargo has done in relations to its use of sales goals, we feel that uh, this kind of disclosure is appropriate within the RFP, right? And we. We also uh, see if the council moves forward with this, it uh, will demonstrate that the city is serious about um, ensuring that there is transparency in how the banks provide their products and services to consumers. We also support the Divest LA's um, alternative scoring action. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Oreño Opinaldo, followed by Patrick Smith, followed by Polly Chu. Blessings. I, Orino Pinaldo, live in the 8th Council District. I am here today as a consumer, senior citizen, activist, and voter, asking you to address issues of sales goals in the RBO Amendment and Banking Service, RFP. Each year, millions of our taxpayer dollars are paid by the city to banks to manage our money. The city has the right, the obligation, to establish criteria how banks use our money through businesses. Right now, the city has the opportunity to finally get it right on establishing real banking accountability with RBO amendments, which fall short of incorporating protection against predatory sales goal and establish standards that promote socially responsible banking practices. Sales goal and root causes of predatory banking has led to opening more than 3.5 million unauthorized accounts credit cards, and insurance policy. The bank forces bank workers in sales goals to target the most vulnerable. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Patrick Smith, followed by Pauli Chu, followed by Giselle Mata. I'm a member of ACE, and I live in, the, I live in District 11. 
in the best interest of the city of Los Angeles and your constituents, council members need to provide a strong RBO bill that strengthens the RFP to ensure that banks wanted, wanting city contracts are worded of our business. We should have nothing to do with banks like Wells Fargo, Bank of America, who impose sales goals on their employees, forcing them to stiff the, the uh, consumer, especially the elderly and the minority, with services they do not need that profit only the bank's profit margin. But when the banks are caught in their scheme, the employees who were only following instructions from upper management are blamed and fired for trying to put food on their table. Therefore, we need a RBO that will not reward banks for victimizing both the consumer and the employees. Thank you, sir. Uh, our next speaker is Michelle Milner, followed by Polly Chu, followed by Giselle Mata. Did I? Michelle. I messed that up, didn't I? Okay. Sorry. Oh, I, <laughs> wrong pile. Uh, okay. Polly Chu, followed by Giselle Mata, followed by uh, Matt Vasseri. Hi, my name is Polly Chu. I'm here to support uh, the Divest LA proposal um, to include an environmental and injust indigenous justice component in the social responsibility section that's worth at least 10 points. Um, I really support encouraging banks to move toward doing more good and less harm, especially for the environment. Um, and I support the um, Divest LA has a proposal of for an in-house evaluation um, if we don't want to do the third party rating that would take into account, a, among other things, take into account a ratio of carbon emissions and reduction in bank finance pro uh, projects. So really moving towards fewer emissions and more carbon reduction um, that's going to support well, not all of us, of course, not only all of us in the planet, but supporting the mayor's sustainable city plan and the city's no DP, DAPL resolution. So thank you. Sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Giselle Mata, followed by Matt Viseri, and that's the last card that I have on item number eight. Great. Afternoon. Hello. Thank you, council members, for your leadership on this issue. Um, during the holidays, let us be mindful of the millions of Americans who have been defrauded by predatory sales goals practices by the big banks. Many consumers have been stripped of their wealth through bank fees, debt traps, as a result of bad loans and foreclosures. We have brought you a symbol of what is happening to Angelinos as real representation of dollars off the plates of Angelinos. Um, every unethical banking practice that defrauds our residents ensures that less is left on the plates of Angelinos, especially senior citizens, immigrants, students, and low-income in customers, and ultimately our children. Please take the time and read the messages on the plate as we give them to you later today. We want you to understand that this is real food off of our community's table and less reinvestment in those same communities. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Vasseri. Hi, I'd like to just say I'm here to support Divest LA's pr uh, proposals. And on a personal note, drawing upon my experiences in Haiti, I see and have seen the life and death consequences of a lack of a proper banking and credit system, as well as a functioning government. I'm proud to be a citizen with a safe forum to address grievances. However, I am concerned by irris the irresponsibility of a banking sector that has lost its way. I hope the City Council will enact and uphold a social responsibility and RBO with real teeth. And at the risk of sounding ridiculous, I encourage you to support what Divest LA has proposed for democracy, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir, and thank you to all uh, who spoke. Uh, I'd like to ask the Office of Finance to come on up now. Good 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Todd Bowie with uh, Office of Finance. And we've uh, submitted a report uh, before you that uh, seeks to uh, respond to a number of the different questions that committee had at uh, the prior committee meeting, as well as to address uh, several <coughs> issues that committee identified. Uh, hopefully, um, we've done that to your satisfaction here. I'll go ahead and walk through a couple of the areas where we've identified uh, changes uh, to the RFP uh, versus the original draft that we su submitted, if that's okay. And then um, I'll hand it off to uh, my counterpart here, Saul Romo, to talk to you a little bit about uh, other responsible banking ordinances. Very good. Thank you. So to, uh, to start off, um, the, main, the main change here, I think, is with uh, proposing uh, a new scoring system. Uh, in the prior scoring system, uh, social responsibility was uh, wed into the first couple of phases at uh, 20 points or 20 percent of each of each of those phases and pricing was left to the third and final phase um, in the new scoring as proposed it boils down the process to two phases uh, first of all we establish the organizational capacity of the financial institutions with which we'd be doing business. So we're looking at things like their financial capacity, customer service, uh, their references, their plans for implementation, uh, that they meet our requirements, their services, and price. And based on that, uh, for those that score at least a 70 uh, within that 100 point phase one scoring system, uh, would advance to the second phase. So these would all be identified as financial institutions qualified to do the city's business. In the second phase, all of the weight is given to social responsibility, which is given 30 points. And in this system, we believe that this gives social responsibility uh, the opportunity to be a real difference maker in the selection process, the differentiator between, um, between banks, particularly banks uh, who may be both very competitive and like scored in the organizational component, um, this would uh, be a separator uh, between those banks. Um, furthermore, uh, in, in discussion with the committee um, about the social responsibility component, um, we've uh, uh, suggested further breaking that down into two components. So taking that 30 points, and breaking it into um, one component which really weighs heavily the enforcement actions um, and then the second component being the community lending uh, investing and banking services component and and so with that you have uh, the opportunity to weigh within 15 points all the any and all the various actions that have been taken by regulatory agencies uh, versus the banks and so you sort of have a situation where um, you may be knocking down a score, say, in order to um, weigh how many negative actions may have taken place and how significant those actions were. And in the community lending, investing, and banking services component, uh, this is where the financial institutions would be identifying uh, their footprint, uh, primarily within the city of Los Angeles. Um, you know, how much money is going into the community? Um, what types of groups are is the money going into? Um, you know, what types of services are they offering to our community? And uh, these are these are sort of aligned with your Community Reinvestment Act um, uh, reporting. And, and so you kind of have your, um, your, your, your positive, your negative components. Um, what we have suggested taking out uh, was there was a third component in the draft which spoke to um, their philanthropy. And um, there was some discussion about, you know, whether or not that should be weighted or whether um, that uh, should be allowed to outweigh um, other components uh, such as some of the negative actions that were that have taken place and so we've suggested that we can remove that component where they would be identifying philanthropy charitable giving um, I think that it would also be helpful uh, from our perspective in 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 the discussion of how to wait or how do we how do we kind of evaluate these things 
is that with enforcement actions and the community investment components, um, those are more quantitative uh, sort of components um, with the corporate citizenship, as we had dubbed it, uh, where you're talking about their um, charitable work. There is some component of that that's sort of empirical, but it also is very narrative um, sort of driven. And uh, so we think that the, the more quantitative components are the enforcement actions and the community lending components. And so um, if, if, uh, if those changes would satisfy the committee, um, we are recommending um, those changes uh, ourselves as well. Um, a couple other areas I'll, hi I'll highlight is um, the discussion around um, predatory practices. Uh, we've um, sort of refined the language that we're using here. And I, and I know that there's um, a lot of discussion about the, the language or choice of language. Um, it, I think we're, we're really pinning um, um, our, our language on the word illegal, um, primarily because that's what gives us the best opportunity to identify when a violation has occurred. Uh, so we're really relying on other regulatory agencies to um, identify when a practice has occurred that is illegal. Um, those may be, you know, considered predatory um, or, or other, but uh, I think you find in, in the example of the um, actions that uh, Wells Fargo had taken relative to opening accounts, um, this would very much apply because obviously there were illegal actions that were taking place with opening, with opening accounts. And, and so we feel that um, the, the language and hinging on, on the word illegal, um, but also identifying that this would include predatory practices um, and is, uh, is language that we can adhere to and are able to uh, enforce within the, within the context of the, um, of the RFP and, and the contract. Um, similarly with the discussion on enforcement actions, again, we were discussing, you know, how do we, how do we identify, what do we want to identify, um, how do we refine it so it's not uh, so open-ended, and, and again, uh, we're looking at other regulatory agencies uh, that exist uh, over the banking industry and identifying it as infractions as determined by those other agencies. So uh, we've come up with um, a bit of a laundry list of, of various en en entities that regulate uh, the banking industry here and identified that uh, if, if they've run afoul of any of these, in, of any of these regulatory agencies, that these are the, in, the agencies that, from which we'd expect to see reporting um, accordingly. And, and, and as well as it would be part of the scoring component, as I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, if you like, we can speak to these components now, or I can um, refer here to uh, Mr. Saul Romo, and he can talk a little bit about um, responsible banking ordinance and what we found in other jurisdictions. Um, yeah, I guess why don't we go ahead and complete your report uh, before we, we go to questions. Good afternoon, Saul Romo with the Office of Finance. So pursuant to your request, we did a review of some of the um, responsible bank ordinances that um, existed in municipalities nationally. And there's an attachment to our report that lists those agencies that were reviewed with a general overview uh, of the matrix of some of the fields, areas that we're particularly looking at within the ordinances to see if they address the issue. Just about all of these agencies that are listed in the attachment, um, some of which are California agencies of larger sizes, some smaller sizes, all address um, responsible banking in some capacity. I believe the city of San Diego <clears throat> specifically um, called it socially responsible banking. But they all had elements in which they're either addressing um, predatory lending practices, they were requesting information uh, that it was obtained through the CRA requirements or information on specific lending practices in those municipalities. Some observations that I think are worth noting and highlighting to the committee are when compared to our existing ordinance and what we're proposing, um, clearly our existing ordinance doesn't identify as many of the issues that some of these existing uh, municipalities have. 
but as we incorporate some of the items that this committee is pondering and have been proposed, our, it strengthens our ordinance to really um, be similar and in some areas stronger than most of the ordinances we saw nationally. Um, for instance, we would be one of the only agencies that it deals with a non-retaliatory um, practice in that if an employee identifies frayed wa waste or abuse by, by a financial institution and how it manages city money and discloses that information that they are offered protections. Um, similar to, I guess, our, our Office of the Controller's whistleblower um, practices. Almost all of them address predatory lending in some capacity or another by basically stating that they would not deposits um, their respective agency's monies in an agency that has um, engaged in predatory lending, pra predatory lending um, um, practices. What some of these agencies fell short in, is in identifying what is a predatory lending practice. At least two agencies uh, used a similar model that the city of LA is pondering and simply identifying a predatory lending practice as an illegal lack that has been identified by a court. Um, as illegal predatory practice. Um, some agencies don't define a predatory lending practice as much as defining what is a illegal predatory loan and if a financial institution is engaged in those type of loans, they are deemed to be in violation of a predatory lending um, act. The, um, all the agencies require the disclosure of lending information. They wanna know how the banks are, are investing the communities to address um, the underserved communities by providing um, mortgage, mortgage loans, small business loans, investments in the community. So that was a, an issue that was just replete in all of these agencies. So we're certainly consistent in that activity. Um, we only, um, interestingly enough, some of these agencies also have established a community reinvestment act, uh, committee to evaluate a diff to various degrees what the respective financial institutions are doing in those, in those um, respective agencies. Some cities that re require a community reinvestment plan, meaning they want the financial institution to lay out a plan some, as far as two years out, some on an annual basis, to set out for the, for the city what is going to be your proposed lending activity to help underserved communities within the next year? How do you plan to ameliorate some of the, um, um, some of the um, repressed city, um, areas in the city through affordable housing, through community development? And some of these committees would address some of those issues. Interestingly enough, some agencies also go so far as to request financial information from the bank to annually evaluate the financial strength to make certain that they um, can maintain their, their financial solvency in managing the municipality's monies. Um, almost all agencies, with the exception of a handful, require the CRA rating and establish minimum qualifications on their CRA rating. And what we found most interesting, or at least what I found of particular interest, is the extent to which some of these agencies have codified in their respective ordinances a requirement on how the cities are going to address um, social responsibility or in, either through lending or predatory sales as an RFP selection criteria. For some, for instance, as the city of Seattle has lay, lays out a specific value um, to and weight to be attributed to social responsibility. Others specifically state that, that, that the city shall consider lending activity and the types of loans as part of the RFP selection. So in, in looking at the gamut of, uh, of all of the information here, once you take action on some of the proposed or, or not on, on some of the proposed RBO um, elements, it would certainly make the city consistent with some of the other agencies and certainly in one area, an enforcement action, we would be the only agency that actually would request on the disclosure of either pending or prior enforcement action by some regulatory agency. Okay. So that thank concludes you. the comments. All right, um, thank you. And with regard to weighting of social responsibility in the RFP process, your research in comparison with other cities suggests, at least what's presented in the report here, suggests that under the revised approach that finance is recommending today, um, the weight of the social responsibility component in our RFP 
would still exceed what has been done by any other city to date. Is that right? That is correct. Okay. And the reason for changing the staging of it is essentially to ensure as an initial matter that the taxpayer's uh, deposits are fully protected by the financial strength of the institutions. That's a, that's a gateway decision that has to be made first. And once they qualify under that uh, factor, then we would take into account the much more significant consideration of social responsibility uh, in the second phase. Correct. Sir, sir, uh, satisfying that fiduciary requirement is certainly paramount and, and was a significant part of our consideration. Um, and we feel that the new um, solution uh, achieves both goals. Okay. Some of these agencies, and it's not noted here, but in establishing the requirements of social responsibility and outline that there should be part of the RFP process, also delineate what are some of the requirements for some of these depository institutions to maintain to demonstrate their financial strength and what information they have to provide to the agencies to ensure that that fiscal um, component is part of the decision making. Mm -hmm. And then with regard to um, the, uh, re the proposed redefinition of what considerations go into the social responsibility uh, uh, discussion, dropping corporate citizenship and philanthropy and, and those sorts of things. I have to say that I think when we first brought this up, Mr. Bonin raised it, I think, and, and I think Mr. Kretz did as well. I, I, forgive me, I don't remember who all discussed this, but at the time it struck me, I was a little troubled by it um, because it seems to me that that's something we want to encourage. But upon reflection, and especially upon seeing this, I can see that really the larger entities would be disproportionately advantaged by that consideration. Community banks, for example, may not be able to do as much as a national bank. And at the same time, as, as I think you expressly said, Mr. Bonin, that you, do, you don't want somebody who's not performing well in any other social responsibility factor to be able to just write a check and kind of buy their way out of that consideration. So I think there's, uh, I think that there's a, a very legitimate reason to, to do that. That makes good sense to me. Um, with regard to how the panel, the scoring panels would be set up under the RFP, in, in any other RFP context, um, does the city ever go outside of city employees of the city or of peer agencies in um, creating panels to evaluate Yes, uh, uh, we do. Um, there, I don't know historically for finance if that's been the case or not, certainly not in the, in the recent past. Um, but for this particular RFP, um, we've been uh, in di discussing with um, San Francisco about um, reciprocal par participation in RFP processes. And so um, I don't want to, you know, commit them completely, but, uh, but I believe that they will be a member of our, our RFP panel. Um, and or if not, we probably look for another um, like agency, uh, okay. someone who uh, really can adhere to our um, responsibilities from a fiduciary perspective and understand the types of services and the nature of, of the agreement that we are putting into place. So you by doing, a, by creating a panel like that, you would achieve the objective of creating some independence from the office's own employees, um, some, a, a, a fresh set of eyes looking at it, for example. Right. But still, it wouldn't get to the point of having, um, being outside of the context of, um, of a, a, an evaluation by a municipal government entity about its own fiduciary responsibilities as Correct. well as its social responsibilities. Correct. Yeah, we, we feel that um, in particular importance is, is the um, applying the, the uh, investor prudence um, to the decision-making process. And, and so that's, that's something that uh, you know, we feel we need to have someone who understands that and is uh, able to uphold that in the decision-making process. And if I could just add that, yes. although San Francisco is not in the matrix because um, they don't have a lot of socially responsible 
or RBO codified information in their ordinances. Their RFP, which is one of the RFPs we looked at as a template, had a very robust um, requirement for reporting on social responsibility um, and some of the elements of which we borrowed for our, our RFP. And so the, while they may not be in the matrix, you know, they bring with them not just the institutional knowledge of a large government agency that right. is close to being a peer for us and in the state of California that hopefully um, well, we could have them on our committee. Okay. Um, oh, but, and before I forget it, and I'm sorry, I'll move on to other members, but be, before I forget it, um, New York's response, uh, was it their RBO or their RFP process that was um, uh, found to be, uh, that was overturned by the, the court on, I guess, on preemption grounds? Correct, right? correct. Uh, was the, was which the one was it? Was it their Responsible RBO? banking ordinance. Okay. So we'll talk about that more in the next item, but was that, did that relate to this issue of defining what predatory practices was, or was it something else? You know, I think it's something we, we just ran across, um, and the, we weren't previously aware uh, of it, but we ran across it as we were going through. Uh, I, I don't know that um, city attorneys had enough time to process, um, you know, that information. Um, but uh, we, we did identify that issue. It just struck me because as you were discussing how to define what a predatory practice is in a way that is not subjective, um, you know, if, if, you, if you fail to have some objective measure there, it really could potentially put the city in the, in the shoes of a regulator, which could conceivably cause the whole RBO to be tossed out as being... I, I think that be. would require a little bit more investigation. And uh, uh, the, the City of New York tried to establish its Responsible Banking Act, or its, its RBA, in response to the 2008 lending crisis and financial crisis. And ultimately, you know, the federal court's decision reinforced the, prim the primacy of federal and state um, law in the area of banking regulation and, you know, made it clear that municipalities Municipalities cannot circumvent the pre the, the preemption the preemption doctrine, uh, you know, and and regulate banks, and so to the extent that our RBO would be consistent with with the court's decision, I think that would take a little bit more more scrutiny than certainly uh, the times allowed us. Okay, very good, members, Mr. Kretz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wonder if the city attorney could. Uh, Remind us why we can't completely exclude misbehaving banks from even being considered, and why we just have to include them in the scoring process. Um, I'll try. I tried to address that. I think to the extent that I can. Well, no, I, I defer. <laughs> Good afternoon, Noreen Vincent from the City Attorney's Office. Um, and, and I think the, the question, I think, depends on when you say a misbehaving bank. Um, if, if, for example, um, there were a bank that had violated laws and, and we were in a position to look at them and determine whether or not their proposal was something that we could look at and debar them, I think the city always has that, but that is a process that requires due process. So you would have to look at the proposal and, and give them what is referred to as an Inglewood hearing, where you give them notice and an opportunity to be heard before you can outright disqualify them. I think there are a number of the things that the city can do short of that. One of the things that was discussed basically was to look at the city's obligations consistent with state law. So the first Thing we look at is there are certain requirements under state law that identify the type of institution that the city can do banking business with. So assuming that the banks meet those state law requirements, then we would proceed to go through the rest of the city's requirements to determine if we are living up to our fiduciary obligations that is following the prudent investor rule. And there are a variety of things that are set forth in state law that we would look to. So for example, we would look to the liquidity of the assets, the rate of return on deposits, and the collateralization of the deposits. 
So I think you're going far afield from okay, the question. Okay, I, I don't want to go far afield. So. My question is, how do we? How, why can't we just eliminate a bank that is a bad actor, rather than having to go through this process that's well, been laid out? If, and if, if we can, should we call that out in our ordinance as an option? Well, I I think if you were going to, and I guess let me, if you felt that or the Office of Finance felt that they had sufficient information to effectively preclude someone from doing business with us, that would be a debarment and we would have to, if they applied for our proposal, submitted a response, we would have to give them notice and an opportunity to be heard. If we followed the process that I think has been set forth here this afternoon, we would go through and we would do the evaluation and we got to the second phase of it, which is where we're considering the social responsibility or the social justice component. They may not indeed wind up with the city's business based upon the scoring in that process. So I think in answer to your question, there would be a number of different approaches that the city may utilize depending upon what what data, what evidence we had. Um, and of course, if in fact banks have done things uh, that are against the law, as we've seen, our office was actually able to bring a lawsuit against Wells Fargo for a uh, consumer 17200 case. So I think the city has a variety of uh, tools in our toolbox that we can utilize. So that would, using Wells Fargo as the most obvious example of a well-publicized bad actor, um, would we be able to just eliminate them by going through the process that you've outlined of giving them a hearing on their mm -hmm. their their reasons for disqualification and debarment and then I, not I, go through the rest of the process. I, I think I'm not in a position to, to judge that now, but um, as has been pointed out, we actually have a number of criteria that are viewed um, to the composition of the social responsibility criteria. So it would be compliance with the city's responsible banking ordinance, the National and State Community Reinvestment Act rating, and compliance with the city's requirements consuming, regarding consumer adverse practices. So a bank or an institution uh, competing for city business would have to comply with those requirements. Yeah, and just to be more explicit on that, though it's a non-qualifying proposal if they don't meet those requirements. It isn't a matter of scoring. Right. It's if they don't comply with the RBO and Correct. if they don't comply with the CRA uh, rating that we're requiring, they're, they're, not a conf they're not a qualifying bidder. Correct. So, so to Mr. Kretz's points, they would be excluded from, from if, bidding. If they did not, that, that's correct. If they did not comply with the uh, fundamental requirements that we have, as, as we've identified here, then they would be non-responsive and wouldn't be considered as, as part of the process. So there I think go. it depends on where they would fall in the process. And uh, although it, it might be more appropriate in item seven, I'm not entirely clear. Um, I know your, your version of the ordinance, uh, again, does not include the term predatory uh, because of the difficulty in, in defining in law. Um, there, there are a number of definitions that we found in a lot of different places, um, some as, as uh, uh, accessible as the dictionary, which I think has a really good definition. Uh, inclined or intended to injure or exploit others for personal gain or profit, i.e. predatory pricing practices. And they also, under predatory lending, define the practice of lending money to a borrower by use of aggressive, deceptive, fraudulent, or discriminatory means. So I think very clear, well-defined um, descriptions are, are uh, uh, not difficult to run across, and I have several others, but I think that's the simplest and most on-target one. Um, if we don't believe there's a definition in law, why don't we put the definition um, such as that one into our own ordinance? And is there any reason why that wouldn't solve that concern? I, I think there was some concern that we um, looked at and whether we would be 
using a, a definition, creating a definition in the ordinance, or whether we would simply capture that as part of the illegal activity that was identified in the ordinance. So I think the, the thought was that it would be clear if there were an act that were found to be illegal, that we would be able to use that as a, a basis for uh, grading down or not awarding to a particular institution. I think the concern was that the term predatory may be subject to uh, some vagueness, but we can certainly go back and revisit that issue. But that was the concern, is that we would be able to capture bad conduct that amounted to illegal activity in the ordinance. Yeah, I, th I think our, the challenge that we had was we're reliant on others' definitions uh, as enforcement agencies in order in order to apply the definition. So if we were to develop our own definition that was outside of maybe what the regulatory agencies are doing, uh, we would have a challenge with how to apply it. Um, so it may, something may appear to us, but we wouldn't necessarily be able to get access to the same types of information uh, that the regulatory agencies would in making a determination as to whether or not something met that definition. Um, there was, I think, one jurisdiction, was it, I remember it was Pittsburgh or Philadelphia, I think it was one of the two, where they went to great lengths to define predatory lending uh, specifically. Um, but it was, it was highly detailed um, to the extent that they were even identifying um, what percentage of the population was impacted, et cetera. It was, it was an entire um, multi-page uh, section, and it wasn't responsible banking per se. It was something that they codified in their, um, in their code. And, and so there is, and what they were requiring then was that the um, institutions that the city does business with basically certify that they're complying with that city's definition of, um, of predatory lending. Uh, any reason why we couldn't go ahead and do something similar? Possibly. Um, it's, uh, it's not something that uh, I think has been to, had been discussed uh, previously. That only speaks to the lending um, portion, and it probably would you know, entail some uh, amount of, of policy discussion with regard to how we wanted to define that as a city, but we could certainly bring that example forward. Well, that's, that's certainly one thing I'd recommend. It was also suggested by one of the speakers that um, we require disclosure of sales goals, not that we ban all sales goals, but we disclose them. Do we see any legal impediments to requiring that? I, I so basically, if, I'm, if I uh, understand correctly, they, we'd be basically asking them to disclose whether or not they have sales goals and how they apply those sales goals. Um, yeah, basically, what, what are those goals? Right. So I guess the question then would be, how would we use that information? So if, if we're using that under the social justice or so, social equity part of the uh, RFP review, would the existence of the sales goals militate against a, a good grade? Or how, I, I'm just not sure. So I'm not saying we can't do it. I'm just trying to figure out how do we practically implement something like that? And, and how do we uh, count or evaluate or score based on that? Or if it was just informational, uh, similar to some of the things in the RBO now. So if we're just asking for disclosure, or so if we're just I, I asking just for disclosure, disclosure would, we can do that. Would solve a lot of the problems because if they had a a set of sales goals that were not humanly possible in the normal course of business, we'd be able to spot that relatively easily. So if you had Wells Fargo style sales goals, um, it would be pretty obvious that no one could meet those without engaging in inappropriate behavior. Um, whereas if you had perfectly normal sales goals that just show you're able to make sales and you're competent in your job, um, I think it would be pretty easy to spot that as well. And I think uh, if they had predatory sales goals, they they couldn't, with a straight face, disclose them and expect to still get our business or anyone else's business. So I think just providing the goals, if 
if we have the ability to do that, I think would solve a lot of the problem. So I think what you're asking for then basically at this point is to add that to the list of things that would be disclosed as part of the uh, RBO? If, if we don't see any legal problem with doing that. Well, well, hold on, because I want to make sure we're clear on what we're talking Because right now we're talking about the RFP on this agenda item. Um, and we've been talking about them both okay. because they're kind of related. But, Mr. Kretz, are you suggesting that as part of an ordinary, as a part of the RBO or as part of the RFP process? Because I think that th those two things have different import. Um, I don't think so. Or both. I'm not sure which which place they would be more appropriate, but certainly in the ordinance. The, uh, the, the ordinance would ultimately apply to anyone we're doing business with, and so the ordinance has a, a lasting and broader effect than the RFP. So I guess that would be under that section, but obviously one applies to the other. Well, it only goes in one direction, though. If it's in the RBO, it applies to everybody in the RFP. But if it's in the RFP, it doesn't apply to everybody who would be covered by the RBO. And right. So we'd probably uh, want in the ordinance rather than, than the RFP. Well, I, then if that's the case, I would suggest that the city attorney also evaluate whether or not that puts the city in the position of becoming of a bank York. regulator and um, endangering the, you know, the entire RBO as being preempted because that's requiring a disclosure of things that they wouldn't otherwise be required to, to disclose under any other banking ordinance. So, uh, anyway, it's not saying we couldn't do it. I just that, that needs to be a part of the equation as as well. And, and also, do we do we think that the weighing of social responsibility as we have is enough to uh, basically eliminate bad actors? in both uh, the environmental and uh, and other problematic areas? Well, I, th I think it, it will, the, as, as what's been established, it will um, qualify, it will allow for qualified banks, and it will differentiate between those banks that are qualified. So I know that doesn't uh, directly answer your um, question, but I don't, I don't know if, if I could surmise to what degree the banks who are qualified to do the city's business, you know, will or will not be viewed as good actors. All right. Mr. Bonnet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, a, a couple different things. <clears throat> First of all, let me say uh, to, to staff, uh, to Mr. Bowie and to Mr. Romo, thank you for the, the work you've done on this. Uh, I think <clears throat> this committee had a lot of concerns and questions last time, a few weeks ago, and this is before us, and I think you've done a, a good job in addressing a, a lot of those. Um, just going sort of in order of your, your, your presentation, uh, I like the way you uh, revise the scoring structure into the two tiers. I think that uh, uh, makes a, a, a very good step towards addressing social responsibility in the way that uh, this committee and others on the council had hoped. Um, uh, I, I think that's, that, that's good, and I think it balances well the uh, needs that we've heard articulated uh, about our, our fiduciary responsibility as well. I think that was well done. Um, I had a question on the, the breakdown of the social responsibility scoring. I haven't seen anything in writing, but a number of the folks who testified today talked about the importance of having points uh, uh, within the social responsibility scoring for um, environmental criteria and sustainability. Uh, is that something we can do? That's not something that has been part of our consideration. It's not uh, presently in there. Um, I know in, in having, a, I received a copy of the report as well, and um, in taking a look at it, it's, uh, it's hard to say exactly how we would apply it offhand because we haven't really considered it. Um, we'd have to take a look, uh, identify what would be comprised of, um, figure out how to apply it and how it would hold up um, in terms of our uh, review process. I, and it was also uh, discussed uh, the consideration of using sort of like a third party uh, rating system and, and what that would entail. So I'd say um, we, do, we would just need to do uh, a fair amount, a little more work to figure out how that would be applied. Um, I don't believe, to my recollection, that we had seen that addressed 
in other RFPs? I don't know, Mr. Romo, if you recall that or something that we could model after. We haven't seen that in the other RFPs. Probably, um, the, you know, just the, you know, just thinking I'm off the cuff right now. It, in looking at how a bank would be able to present this information is, you know, they're in the business of, of lending inf uh, money. And are they lending toward projects or toward organizations that are in the business of environmental sustainability that have, um, uh, are making attempts to minimize their, their footprints um, uh, on environmental impacts? So it's, as opposed to, let's say, financing a coal mine, are you financing um, solar powered energy? Um, <clears throat> so we would have to probably get that information from the banks to see, give us examples. But then conversely, um, how do you treat institutions that are financing projects that may be considered um, not environmentally friendly or um, not friendly towards sustainability? Um, you know, we've heard a lot about the, the Dakota pipeline in this in this room, and so um, you know that could certainly be something that's incongruous to what which you would be pondering here. Yeah, I, am, I imagine it would be difficult to do. I, but my, my preference would be for us to, to, to see how we can do it. I think given that so much of the energy behind this has been started from folks who were opposed to the Dakota Access Pipeline, that I think we sort of owe that consideration uh, of, of putting that in uh, to the ordinance. Um, and it's consistent with the, the, the city's position on, on environmental stuff. Um, on the, the, the question that, moving on to my second point, the question that Mr. Koretz just raised about uh, disclosure, uh, I, I, I too would like to see us have the disclosure provision in there about uh, sales goals and, and, uh, and lending practices. Um, I, uh, and it's, I, I guess there, there are two ways to, to go about it. If we could have it in the ordinance or we could have it in the RFP. If it's in the ordinance, it's automatically in the RFP. Um, but if, for whatever reason, it's not in the ordinance, it could still be in the, the RFP for at least uh, the, the respondents to the RFP. And, and I, I think the way to do it, and in, question, in response to the city attorney's question, I think it's purely for transparency and disclosure purposes. It may help us revise the RBO or the RFP in, in, in future years may help us gain the information necessary to come up with the precise definition of predatory that, that Mr. Koretz wants in future years. The way I'd suggest we do it is uh, in the, the RFP, there's section 9.1.4 and consumer practices. What I'd ask is, or what I propose, is that um, we ask for uh, a disclosure of the, the, the structure of uh, uh, sales for consumer financial products along the lines of the criteria that Ms. Martinez outlined in her letter of a few weeks ago, um, which are essentially whether or not the institution sets uh, individual or branch level goals or requirements uh, for sales of uh, consumer financial services, not regional, just individual or branch level. Um, I think the second one Ms. Martinez raised was um, uh, whether or not uh, uh, the quantity of an employee's sales or services is a consideration for their termination or discipline, um, and um, what percentage of the frontline employee's compensation is baseline pay versus sales quota based. Uh, I think those are the points Ms. Martinez raised. So I, th I think that might suit somewhat of what Mr. Koretz is seeking to address, and we could at least have it in the RFP if it's more complex to put it in the RBO. Um, and the third point I wanted to raise, I want to thank Mr. Romo so much for the, 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 the matrix. Uh, I really thought that was an important tool for us to figure out how to go forward. And I thought it was uh, telling in a, in a number of different ways. I think it showed that a lot of what we're proposing is stronger than a lot of jurisdictions, and that was gratifying. And uh, it showed where there might be some holes. And I, I really appreciated the... Uh, the uh, last part of Ms. Bartel's uh, letter re referencing Mr. Romo's matrix, um, which said that some agencies establish a community reinvestment, reinvestment review committee uh, and that uh, some agencies require institutions to provide an annual or in some cases a two-year plan for community involvement 
and reinvestment strategies. I think um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the most underserved and low-income parts of the city don't have a representative directly on this committee, but uh, I think that's been a major concern among members of, of this council in seeing how um, uh, the, the banks that we do business in are investing in our city, not just in the, the sort of philanthropic ways that we addressed last time, and thank you for taking that out, but sort of in a, in a broader strategy about affordable housing, about investing back in our city. And uh, when I look at the, the graph and the matrix you did, um, five of the other jurisdictions have the Community Reinvestment Committee, uh, and all but New York has the Community Reinvestment Plan. And um, I would think it would be really important for Los Angeles for us to, to have those components in, in what we do. I imagine that's a hell of a lot more difficult than just saying we need to, to have it, because there'll be discussions about how it's composed, what the elements are. So I'm not exactly sure, Mr. Chair, how we would get from, from A to Z on that. But um, I think those would be really fundamental at getting at some of what the real core issues are here, both in terms of social equity and responsibility, but in terms of long-term investment in, in Los Angeles. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you. Um, I want to start by echoing some of my, my colleagues' uh, gratitude for the way that you guys have, have handled this. I think you've done a, a great job in terms of trying to take this complex issue and bring us something that's, that's workable. So, so thank you for the good work on that. A couple of, of questions. Um, on the social responsibility phase, the community lending, investing, and banking services, 15 points. Um, how do we determine those in terms of, I know you're trying to make everything more empirical, but they're, they're fairly, they could be fairly subjective when you're comparing a large bank to a small bank or a new bank to an old bank. Um, so how does that point scale work or how would it work? Sure. Um, well, we would be asking, the information that we would be asking for in the community lending, investing, and banking services it would be, the language we would use is strictly derived from the um, CRA Act. So it's quantitative information that's de clearly defined there, and some, we've borrowed those definitions into our RFP. I think where you're correct, though, council members, that some large institutions and being evaluated by the CRA um, have a different standard than evaluating a smaller bank. So all banks will probably would be able to disclose some lending information, but the, the extent to which they're investing in communities, smaller banks will probably have to think about how they're going to be respond, how they're going to respond to that information. We're um, we're not not in this section, but uh, part of the consideration um, of the uh, bids is going to be their financials, and so we're going to be looking at their financial information and likely providing um, some guidance to the review committee, uh, particularly at looking at trying to compare like to like. You know, it may come in the form of some ratios to help them kind of benchmark um, what a bank has available to it versus what it's putting into the community. And, um, you know, there's a, so if there is a great disparity between the the banks uh, that are bidding that we'll try, we'll try to adjust for that factor. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that there was a way for there to be a narrative and there to be some subjectivity here uh, because there could be some really good banks in some ways that are more socially responsible than a large bank who can score the numbers because they're a large bank. Potentially. Right. So, so you're saying that it's not, it's not strictly quantitative, that there is a qualitative opportunity here for the review committee to to hear a narrative uh, to, to understand what those ratios are and why they are. Yeah, I would. It, may, it just may not be clear cut, and unlike some of these other ones where someone could petition after the fact and say, hey, I scored higher because of X, Y, and Z, if this is strictly a numbers game, then we're going to, then there's no way to, to make those adjustments. Yeah, it's not, not strictly. There will be definitely differences between various categories. Some may be up, some may be down. So it'll be kind of in the context of the whole. But I think to your point, it, it'll be sort of um, to some extent judging the bank against itself. When you, when you look at um, the, the money that they're holding, 
uh, versus the money that they're putting into the community and what areas of the community in particular. So there is a sub somewhat, some subjective element to that as well as a relative scale, I think. Oh, well, and, and also you have to compare and contrast, you know, community lending, investing in, in banking services. There may be a bank that their niche is, is you know, banking folks who are unbanked. And that could be their, that, that they could do all of that and they could do none of the other things. Right. Um, and so you're going to have to figure out a way to compare and contrast, and, and that may be fine for who they are and what their niche is. Um, so I just, I guess I'm just highlighting that as, as right. I think that's a, a fair point too. That you know we'll have to make sure that um, we're rating them, you know, relative to relative to what their mission is um, as well. So that um, if uh, there's nothing happening in one particular bucket. Um, and it's because that's not something that they do, that that's not necessarily something to weight against them. Yeah. And then when my colleagues were talking about the, the sales goals and, and whether you can require that they be put out on the table, I wonder, which, which is good, and I like the idea of a sort of, you know, a, um, checking the boxes, so to speak. I, I wonder, though, if, if we get too deep in the weeds, if we end up with proprietary issues where banks are going to... Um, you know, with different formulas or whatever they have, not, not necessarily be willing or, or legally somehow shielded from, from sharing that information. Because are they sharing it with us as a city um, privately, or are they sharing it with us in a way that is publicly um, accessible? A, a little bit of both. Um, we make, a, we, make a re, we disclose in the RFP that those that their responses are public documents disclosable under the California Public Records Act. Um, to the extent that there is information that is proprietary, proprietary, they would have to identify that information and also identify any protections that they are afforded in order to make that claim. Um, so it, it, would sales goals in some, in some respects be proprietary? It may I think to the extent to the extent that it's a disclosure, it's the the benefit of having it would be that it would be a public um, statement. It could be. I mean, we'd have to look at it. How do we ask the question? Perhaps um, if it's uh, answering a series of questions uh, versus having them um, define very precisely how they compensate. Um, there may be some difference there. I don't know in terms of in terms of how we request a disclosure, but I see your point. Uh, identify it as a legal landmine that we need to figure out uh, how, if we can navigate. Uh, because I, I don't want us to get sued, but I want us to have all the information we can. Um, uh, the other issue we talked about, the predatory loan, you know, predatory loans, how to define that. In, in our last conversation, I mentioned one possibility, a bill that I did in, in the state, and I know you guys were going to look at it, uh, AB 689, having to do with annuities. Did you get a chance to look at that? Yes. And, and that was a, you know, that was the first of its kind, but it was a suitability mm -hmm. uh, attestation where the, 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 the lenders would, would certify that, that based on it was 13 different categories that, that, the, <coughs> the lo that the loans, the annuities, in this case not the loans, were, were suitable for the consumer based on their age and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So is that potentially one way to deal with a predatory uh, loan issue by, by creating some sort of suitability attestation where they, the... I think it, yeah, I think it sort of, um, it, it was uh, obviously oriented towards a regulatory uh, agency and in, in the insurance commission. Um, I think it, it could be similar to um, one of the other cities that we saw that I mentioned earlier, and I, offhand I forget if it was, it was either Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. No, it was Philadelphia. Philadelphia, thank you. Where um, the, uh, the city went so far as to really well define um, what these were, but it, it was uh, somewhat uh, quantitative in certain areas um, as well. And, and so that probably would be something where um, there would need to be a bit more discussion and policy consideration um, as to what would be that definition, um, because then you're looking at defining it sort of in the context of multiple different um, criteria and actions, uh, potentially. So it, so it is, it is a, probably a broader um, conversation, but certainly, you know, one where we can um, come back with what those examples are and 
And of course, you want it to be the systemic, not just a one-off. You know, I'm sure they can find one-off in any bank, but to try to make sure that we're dealing with a systemic predatory practice. Right. Um, right. And the 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 one of the tricky parts has been that a lot of there's a lot of um, language around lending, um, not so much around around sales, and and so. Um, that may be new territory where if we went so far as to apply the same type of approach to sales as, as a few jurisdictions have done to lending, um, you know, it may be new ground, but, um, but not necessarily not doable. One thing, um, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, one thing I just wanted to add on the Philadelphia model, that in, in defining their, their code on the lended, predatory lending practices and predatory loans, they also were borrowing language from their own state laws as well as taking a look at what some of the federal code statutes are with predatory loans. So it wasn't um, an independent model that Philadelphia is making up this, this definition. They were looking at it within the context of, of their own state law and within the context of federal law as well. So maybe is there a way to pick up the suitability provision from AB 689 as a state law, even though it's limited to annuities and, and apply it more broadly to what we have here? Yeah, it could be a, a combination of things uh, potentially in there that, um, that could be brought back. Um, it, of course, it all has to be sort of modified into uh, ultimately whatever the, the vision is of, of the council in terms of addressing uh, sales goals as well as, as well as lending, presumably. Thank you. Good. One more question. You've asked one great question. <laughs> Mr. Kritz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as you mentioned us not being a regulatory body, um, I know the Trump administration, not surprisingly in this arena as in others, is looking at removing people that are pro-regulation and appointing people that uh, sort of want to devastate regulation. So. The Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, for instance, they're in the process of appointing someone that doesn't believe in the Bureau as the head of it. Um, where does that leave us if regulatory bodies basically decide that they're now the fox not even watching over the hen house? They're just going to let things go as they might. Um, do we have any ability to regulate locally if the federal government has, has abrogated their own duty? We, we don't have the ability to regulate banks on the local level. We, we are preempted from regulating. So I think that's why it's important to look at the New York case and make sure that what we're doing is, is consistent with the authority that we do have. So we're acting on a proprietary capacity when we're entering into contracts with the banks. But when we, we put it on RFP and, and go through that process, that's presumably a little different than actually regulating the banks themselves. It, it is. So, but, but I think that's why we just want to be mindful that we don't do anything in our proprietary capacity that, that blurs the line or looks like we're attempting to regulate because that, that is something on which we are preempted. Okay. Anything else, members? Um, I, I want to also um, applaud uh, all of you for the work that you've done on this. Um, I think we've gone so far forward, and, and you've responded to basically everything the committee has asked you to respond to. Um, I think it's also a reflection of the consistent and determined activism of many of the people in this room uh, that we've come as far as we have in this to the point that um, the ordinance that we, or, uh, excuse me, let's stick with the RFP for the moment, but this RFP that we're about to go out on um, will provide the highest degree of um, social responsibility analysis that has ever been done as far as we can see. And that really is a tribute to the community working with us and, and our staff uh, to get this done. So um, I, I recognize that there are a few things that a number of people have, have wanted as, as small refinements in this. Um, and uh, I, I get that. And you should keep pushing for those things uh, because that's how we make progress. But at the same time, 
at the same time, I don't want to let the perfect be the enemy of the good, and I want to get going already. So we have a we have before us members uh, recommendations of staff uh, that I think have, as I say, responded to everything we've asked them to do so far, um, and I think it's time we move this forward to council, get a council vote, and uh, get this. Um, significantly improved RFP uh, process rolling. So it would be my recommendation uh, that we proceed with the RFP as amended by the Office of Finance uh, report and uh, move forward to council. Um, Mr. Craig. Uh, there were a few things that we did mention which I still would like to see in this. I don't know if there's a way to uh, make an attempt to add those between here and when this comes to council. I don't know what the the date is for that. Um, particularly well, the idea of sales goals disclosure and uh, having a reinvestment plan or committee as as part of this process. Let's talk for just a minute about timing because we've kind of kept this in committee and we've kept working on it. We've kept improving and. I don't know how close we're getting to the point in time where we're really running short on time to and members of the audience may not see it as often we as we do but what tends to happen is we wait until towards the end we get an RFP out and then we get the results back from staff and people object to it and we say oh well we're out of time because our contract's going to run out and if we don't so we're, we're then put under the gun to do something that maybe we don't necessarily want to do. So I don't want us to get into that position with our banking contracts. So um, how are we doing in terms of the timing of all our, this? Our objective is uh, still to get uh, new contracts in place prior to June 30th. And at this point in time, uh, I believe we can, if we were to move forward, we can still meet the original schedule that we set out a few weeks ago. Um, we've eaten into a little bit of the time yeah. probably for the ramp up process um, and we'll have to do some rewriting um, in the next week or so to um, make certain adjustments to the scoring um, but I believe at this point we can still meet that timeline I think if um, we start if we push out a few weeks then we're running into the holiday period and, and probably start shifting the timeline after yeah. that Mr. Hale, do we have a placeholder for this for council yet? Okay. Um, so that would be, I mean, I, I'm welcome to your suggestions. I'm a little concerned about, you know, us pushing this off into January or February um, before we get a council vote if we're going to do further analysis, further legal consideration, further drafting, and so on. Um, I think for we the could, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, for those elements that um, might be part of the responsible banking ordinance, um, as that will apply as law, uh, regardless of the RFP and regardless of um, when it's adopted, um, that that may be a place um, to kind of further refine uh, certain elements. Um, as if uh, in, in with regard to the RFP, um, whoever is awarded that agreement would have to abide by the responsible banking ordinance. So, to be clear on that. If we issue an RFP, we start to receive responses, bids in response to that RFP, and subsequently there are revisions to the RBO, the bidders would be required to be in compliance with the RBO regardless of where they are in that process. Well, ultimately, they would have to be compliant before we finalize our contractual agreement. Until such time as the contract is, is agreed, is, is, is let, right? Well, I, because I think that's even provided in the language that we have before us under the RFP process, that, they, that the compliance has to continue on through the bidding and scoring process right up until the contract's let. Yes. I, so I, typically what happens when an RFP is released and if there were to be an ordinance put in place subsequent to the RFP, um, usually, for example, with our contract responsibility and all of those, they've not been subject to it until the contract was amended. I think your uh, responsible banking ordinance is a little bit different, and I think really what you're doing with that is simply requiring disclosure and updating for the disclosure. So effectively what you'd be doing is the RFP would be released, and to the extent that there was any additional information required, you would be obtaining that pursuant to the responsible banking ordinance. 
prior to. Right. And then even after execution, there would be an obligation to continue to update. Is that correct? And annually, correct. Annually. So you would be getting that information either prior to the execution or as it was updated on an annual basis. Right. So in other words, if, if we if we do some of these additions as part of the RBO, we could proceed with the RFP right now. And up until with some of, with some of the requirements, even after a contract is is executed, well, they would continue to be obligated to perform under even changes to the updated. And I just want to RBO. Um, I think is Beverly and Val. Can you just confirm that the RBO requires that it be updated? I'm sorry. So every July 1st, if you have a contract with us, you have to update pursuant to the RBO. You got to speak to the mic. You got to speak to the mic. There's people listening. So um, Natalie Bill, CAO. So what we do is um, every July 1st, the banks and the investment banks, both commercial and investment side, are required on July 1st to submit their um, information, their form. And then we have 60 days to post it onto our respective websites. But those requirements could be changed at any time. Yes. yes. So we're updating. Right. So yeah. July 1st of, so, of 2018, they've already done the one for 17, right? Right, right, right. So for 18, they're required to respond to the new RBO. So if the RBO were updated prior to, I guess it's the, a timing issue. So as we update the RBO, the requirements to update change, but they only update on an annual basis. Yeah, but so, I, my only point here is there's, there's some urgency to the RFP. Yes. But there's will, no urgency to amendments to the RBO correct. other than moral ones. There's the no, R you know, practical reasons. Correct. The so, RBO will eventually sink into whatever RFP and whatever contract is executed. Right. Okay. So five-year contract is, is let. In year three, we changed the reporting requirements. The contracted party is still required to perform Correct, the Correct, on an annual report. basis. Okay, that's, that's what I need to be clear on. Can I ask okay. a question yes, about Mr. that? Yes, please. <clears throat> of the, of the, the, the two areas that I'm most concerned about, the, um, the disclosure of sales goals and lending practices, there's no problem with that applying to everybody covered by the RBO and not just the RFP. As the RBO is amended, if that requirement is put in there, it would apply to anybody with whom we had a, a contract. And it's okay for us to do that. And it, it's yeah. okay. I think. I, I think what I, I want to just be clear is that you've you've asked for disclosure of certain information, and then there were some additional uh, requirements for additional disclosure. So I just want to make sure. I think Councilman Blumenfeld raised the issue of proprietary information. I just want to make sure that we don't start at some point to possibly cross into what someone may claim is proprietary, and it's possible that if we do get proprietary information. If somebody requests that information, um, you know, depending upon what the Public Records Act, we would withhold it, but we would require that they indemnify us. So I just want to double check and make sure that we're not running afoul of anything. Yeah, and, and that's kind of the point: is that all of those, all of these suggestions require a lot more analysis and thought about what their impacts would be, that would be more appropriately done within the context of the RBO than with the tight time frame that we have now in getting out of the I think RFP. that's correct because we've, we've added things like percentage of pay based on sales goals. So we, we're now getting into much more detail that we're asking for them to disclose. So I think it would be helpful to have some additional time. Not, not to mention, the, sorry, but not to mention the fact that throwing in additional um, reporting requirements now before the issuance of the RFP could have very well have the effect of significantly increasing the cost of even responding to the RFP and reducing or eliminating the bidders that we get who are willing to even participate. No matter what, how good of an actor they are, they may not be able to comply with all of the additional reporting requirements that we're putting on. It increases their cost of bidding. We already have a limited number of financial institutions in the world who can handle these contracts as it is. We're imposing a social responsibility burden on them. When you make it more expensive for them to even bid, we may very well be ruling out the very institutions that we want to do business with who will be most socially responsible. So I think that would be actually a, it has the potential of being a mistake in the RFP. But again, 
we can anal we can analyze that at much greater length with regard to the RBO. So. And the requirement for a community reinvestment plan that could be in the RBO as well. Yes, um, we could we could certainly and, and probably working with um, CAO and, and city attorney and report back with um, more specifically what other jurisdictions are doing in certain areas. Um, such as uh, predatory lending in Philadelphia or what others are doing in terms of the um, community reinvestment plans and committees okay. and that, begin that discussion. That works. So I, of, of the issues I raised earlier, the only one that couldn't be resolved through the RBO is whether or not there can be any uh, points in the RFP criteria for the environmental or the sustainability considerations, right? That's what it seems. And is that, Mr. Kretz, is there anything that you would, I, I think the points that I recall you mentioning I, could be dealt with in the RBO, but I. All, all of these would give me <coughs> greater comfort if they were in the RFP. Um, but if it's something we can't pull together, then it's, it's sort of a secondary choice. I think we probably ideally want sales goals to disclosure in the RFP process, and we probably want to look at their reinvestment strategies in the RFP process. Um, I just don't know whether we'll derail the whole thing or not. But we can I, get it in the R. We can get it through the RBO either way. At any time, w with the exception of the points that you made, which actually directly apply to yeah. the scoring for the RFP. Right, which. That could result in a different selection of who wins the RFP um, if we had those issues as part of it. So, well, how about would it work if we did this? Then I, I just I want to get this off our plate. I want to get it moving towards council the the RFP anyway. I wonder if we could ask that um, prior to it coming back to council, if we can have a report on that that issue regarding further delineating the scoring uh, for social responsibility to include those additional points. If we can have that as a report to the council when it comes back so that uh, that can be considered as a potential amendment to this committee's recommendation. Yeah. Would that work? That would be yeah, great I for sure. That, yeah. Okay. Because the disclosure and the community reinvestment plan wouldn't be part of the, the scoring anyway, so it wouldn't affect that and would actually, and the RBO would have a broader application. So exactly right. I think that would work. Okay. If that works, then is that any objection to that on the part of the committee? All right. Seeing no objection then, uh, everything I just said will be the action of the committee. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to, to staff. Um, we now move uh, into item number uh, seven. And um, probably should have done these in a consolidated way. Um, but. Uh, I do want to give anybody who would like to speak again on the RBO uh, who are among these that opportunity. And there are a few cards that I have on the RBO that did not speak before. So I'm going to flip, flip through the cards. And if you've already said what you, you want to say, that's fine. Just let me know. Um, otherwise, you can come on up and speak again. Okay. Uh, our first speaker is, so this is item number, uh, I've lost track now. This is seven. item number seven. seven. Thank you. Uh, first speaker will be Carol Kravitz. Followed by, you're good? Okay. Shane Phillips, followed by Jessica Law, followed by Gary Tobin. Item number seven is continued from November 6, 2017 to City Attorney Report and Ordinance relative to amending the Los Angeles Administrative Code regarding the Responsible Banking Investment Monitoring Program to require commercial and investment banks which seek city business to disclose any pending government investigations into their business practices, certify they have written whistleblower protection policies and certify they're in compliance with all applicable consumer protection. Thank you. Hey. Mr. Phillips. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is Shane Phillips, and I'm Director of Public Policy for Central City Association. Jessica Lal actually uh, couldn't stay past three, so she won't be speaking. Um, we're an advocacy organization comprised of 400 members focused on supporting downtown's vibrancy and increasing investment in the region. And banks are an important part of our membership and have been key partners investing in downtown's successful revitalization. Um, today, we just wanted to raise one specific concern regarding the proposed ordinance to the Responsible Banking Ordinance. Um, specifically, the, we, we believe that some of these amendments are a bit too broad and don't make it clear 
exactly what information is trying to, uh, the city is trying to obtain from the banks. Um, and the California Bankers Association has submitted a letter outlining these concerns um, and quite a few others in greater detail and have also submitted some uh, suggested revising amending language. Um, so I would urge you to review their proposed language and to diligently consider um, the amendments to the RBO. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Gary Tobin, followed by DeAndre Valencia, followed by Jason Lane. Members of the council, you have a letter from us in front of you. <clears throat> I'm going to follow up on what Shane just talked about and be specific. Uh, rather than the paperwork that you're requiring under disclosure of pending investigations, we suggest that the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau would be a better resource to discern relevant inf enforcement actions and consent orders dealing with the institutions that are looking to do business with the city. Secondly, rather than certification of compliance from thousands of employees in hundreds of locations, uh, we suggest that a certification of the existing policies and procedures be designed to promote compliance. And finally, we do not think that the RBO should require banks to not use compensation sales based on uh, compensation-based sales because in the private sector almost all compensation is based partially on sales and production. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, our next speaker is DeAndre Valencia followed by Jason Lane followed by Trinity Tran. Good afternoon. My name is DeAndre Valencia, the Advocacy Director for the Los Angeles County Business Federation, mainly known as BISFED. I'd like to say thank you for allowing me to speak on this issue today. If you're not aware, BISFED is a grassroots alliance composed over 165 business organizations that represent 325 employers who employ over 3 million residents through Los Angeles County. Our membership has yet to take a position of supporting or opposing this draft ordinance, but we will be making a decision soon, so we'll be watching. But by understanding the makeup of our membership, one can see that we are pro-business and pro-community, and a big part of our education platform is that of responsible governance. As you move forward with this policy, we would ask that you continue to protect LA residents, consumers, and businesses as you are trying to do with this ordinance. Nevertheless, we would suggest that you keep in mind that even though the common perception is that banks have enough resources to meet the additional requirements of the city, there are very few institutions that are, have the cap capacity to manage and volume the complexity of the city's financial needs. Additionally, with drafting the, the, drafting the new and overburdensome policies can and will make the policy harder and more costly. Lastly, let's not get in the business of choosing losers and winners. Let's make sure the playing field is fair. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jason Lane, followed by Trinity Tran, followed by Madeline Merritt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm Jason Lane with the California Bankers Association. As indicated earlier, um, we did late last week submit language to the Office of Finance um, on uh, proposed changes to the RBO. We think the proposed changes go a long way to strengthen the existing RBO, but also allow the, any institution that does business with the city the ability to actually comply with the RBO, and that is the key, uh, the, the key item is, is the ability to comply. And I think, um, you know, if, if the committee wishes, I only have 30 seconds left, I'd be happy to highlight um, the language that we provided. Um, I think uh, you'd be very interested in that and, and certainly send that uh, to you later if, if, not, uh, if, if not reviewing it today. But I will tell you, I think, um, one of the issues that um, is very concerning to us is the notion of sales goals um, and the uh, disclosure of sales goals. I do believe that delves into proprietary information and uh, that's going to be a challenge for any of our institutions. I think in particular the timing of the RBO and our RFP is, is a problem because you're asking somebody to attest to something or disclose something that we don't you know, to, to bid on an RFP but not really know what the RBO will look like at some point in the future, and that's, that's, a, right. that's a challenge. So, okay. um, Thank you very thanks. much. Uh, our next speaker is Trinity Tran, followed by Madeline Merritt, followed by Stuart Waldman. Um, in regards to the RBO, we urge the city to also strengthen the language, the social responsibility language in the R R RBO to reflect the RFP in regards to community lending, community investment, banking services, and enforcement actions with the inclusion of environmental factors to align with the city's goals for sustainability. We also urge the city to enforce a federal and state CRA rating of satisfactory as a qualifier in the RBO. 
Um, as a la at last added note for as far as our community support, Divest LA has the, has the support of over seven, of seven uh, neighborhood councils with three on its way. Um, as far as community impact statements, uh, we have totaling 10 that represent the voices of over 400,000 resident stakeholders in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Madeline Merritt, followed by Stuart Waldman, followed by Patrick Smith. I, I think um, regarding the RBO, um, we need to hold banks accountable to um, our constituents here in the city. And if, um, if they aren't able to comply and do and not harm our citizens, then they shouldn't be doing business with our city, with our public dollars. Um, you know, as we know, millions of our city dollars go to private banking institutions, and maybe the solution here is to have a public banking solution that can do uh, ethical business in the future. Um, so, un unfortunately, I, I don't have a lot of uh, pity for big banks who have uh, sapped the wealth from our communities for decades with that by and never been held accountable for those actions by our city. And we have an opportunity to actually um, ask for better, and I think we should. Thank you. Our next speaker is Stuart Waldman, followed by Patrick Smith, followed by Maria Loya. Good afternoon. I'm Stuart Waldman, president of the Valley Industry and Commerce Association, VICA, representing the business community in the San Fernando Valley. VICA has strong concerns about the proposed amendments to the city's responsible banking ordinance. The proposal would require any bank which seeks to do business with the city to disclose any government investigations, even if the investigation is meritless, as many complaint-driven investigations are. Information on investigations which are actionable and have resulted in fines or other penalties are already publicly available on easily searchable databases. As proposed, the disclosure requirement is overly broad. Any disclosure requirement should be specific as to what type of investigation or alleged con conduct must be disclosed. Additionally, rather than the proposed certification that the institution is in compliance with all applicable consumer protection laws, the city should ensure that banks have policies in place to address violations that do occur by individual employees, including a response to consumers who may have been harmed and lastly, I just want to thank all of you for your hard work, unlike our first speaker of the up. day. But yeah, I appreciate it, but your time is up. So, thank Mr. You. Spindler, if you can't keep yourself from talking to yourself, you're going to have to leave. If you make any sound, you're done. You're, you're dis actually, you're disrupting the meeting. You can go. You can go. Sorry, you can go. Can you please ask Mr. Spindler to head, head for the door, please. Sorry, Mr. Smith, if you could just wait for just a minute while Mr. Spindler completes his performance art. Sorry, folks, we see it every day. Um, by the way, if anybody uh, feels like their ability to participate in this meeting is... Uh, is intimidated or distracted from by the presence of people like that, always just feel free to let our sergeants know and they'll resolve the problem. If, uh, if they're distracting you or preventing you from being able to participate in these meetings. So sorry, uh, Mr. Smith, followed by Ms. Loya, followed by Georgette Sharp. Ms. Sharp, you're, you're, you're good? Okay, thank you. Yeah, what the banks uh, fail to acknowledge is that they have been given the opportunity to serve the community without having much uh, monitoring in regards to the performance, and they have taken advantage of us. So the excuse that they are complaining about these regulations imposed on them, they deserve it, because without those regulations, there will be back to square one. We will, have been, we will be victimized. And one of the things that you have to bear in mind, there's a big difference between sales goals and predatory sales goals. 
There's a big difference between loans and predatory loans. And the banks need to be held accountable because they have been taking advantage of us for years. And there have been no changes in regards to their banking uh, pattern where we are being victimized. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Maria Loya. Um, Ms. Sharp has already completed her, her uh, commentary, uh, followed by uh, Orinio Opinaldo. Thank you. Every day, bank employees are forced to sell a certain number of credit cards, loans, bank accounts, and other financial products in order to prevent them from being fired or disciplined. This is what led to the opening of 3.5 million fake accounts at Wells Fargo. Banks also use sales goals to pressure bank workers to target the most vulnerable in our communities. That include immigrants, senior citizens, low-income customers, um, and students. The Council has an opportunity to incorporate new standards that will strengthen the ordinance, the RBO, to improve transparency and accountability. We urge you to support the disclosure of sales goals, and we are also here to support the Divest LA's uh, alternative scoring uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Orinio Opinaldo, followed by Beverly Roberts, uh, followed by, oops, somebody who didn't put their name. They, so I'm not sure who that is, but um, representing CBB and ACE. But anyway, we'll go with Mr. Opinaldo. For Thank you very much. <laughs> I just want to tell the story why we have to go after the predatory loans and everything else. My granddaughter, who studied hard in finances, got her first job at Wells Fargo and had her sister and aunt set up bank accounts. However, she questioned the predatory loans that the bank demanded. They set her up to be fired by someone stealing several thousand dollars as she went to the bathroom. Being accused of taking the money, she commented, check the camera to see who went to the cash draw. The manager refused. She lost her job and all other jobs in finances. To this day, her young life has been in, diff in difficult pain. That's why we have to make sure that the banks no longer do that. And and I've worked in consumer areas, and they don't even hear us. They're ready more for the banks and everything else, but not for us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Ms. Roberts, did, did you want to speak again? Okay. Thank you. Um, Giselle Mata. Yeah, thank I'll you. fill in my name right after. That's all right. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, Councilman Koretz for also mentioning uh, our current situation around the CFPB as our uh, banker friends like to refer to, uh, which is uh, continuing to uh, attack the leadership in Richard Cordray, as well as um, appoint those that don't believe in any regulation at the federal level. So I thank you for mentioning that. Um, but I do believe that banks that cities choose to do business with will rise to the occasion and follow the RBO once it's strengthened. Um, and for those that don't change their practices, don't deserve the business. So um, we thank you for implementing strong regulation around the Responsible Banking Ordinance. Um, just as we look at other cities' legislation for strengthening um, accountability as bank fraud uh, proliferates in our communities, and going forward, communities are uh, devastated by investments in dirty energy and fraud. So cities will look to L.A. going forward as this fraud proliferates, as this dirty energy pr proliferates, they will look to us, and we want to set a, um, an example of what socially responsible banking looks like. And so I thank you for your leadership on this issue. All right. Thank you very much. Um, finance or city attorney have anything else to add to what you said before? Do you want to you have additional reporting you'd like to do? If not, it's okay. I, I mean, I think we got, we got the gist of it. Um, Okay. Members, any further discussion? After, yes, Mr. Blumenfield. Well, maybe uh, the could have staff respond to, I mean, the, the issue that was raised with regard to pending investigations, because my understanding is that the, I heard some criticisms about the, the ordinance being too broad, but I thought that we narrowed it to some extent. So you could, if you could, 
Natalie Brill, CAO. Um, as you know, the RBO is the ordinance, and we have a form that the banks are required to fill out, whether on the investment side, the investment banking side, which are the city's underwriters when we sell bonds, as well as on the commercial side, which are the banks that we use like for the banking services contract, as well as for the letters of credit for our bond program. And what we're recommending is that um, they answer questions about investigations that basically say, turn to that page, um, in the last five years, has the financial institution been, sub been subject to any enforcement actions, orders, findings, or settlements undertaken by the U.S. Department of Justice, the U.S. Office of the Comptroller, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Federal Reserve, the National Credit Union Administration, the Federal Depository Insurance Corporation, or, and or any state banking regulatory agency. So that is very specific. And, and you said enforcement <clears throat> actions. Yes, we're asking them for any <clears throat> enforcement actions, orders, findings, or settlements undertaken by these agencies. So it's not the, um, you know, did you uh, break a pipe and you were flooded, but was there an action that, you, that actually was taken by one of these regulatory agencies dealing with the banks. But the concern was raised that if there was an investigation that might even be spurious, that somehow <coughs> it would have to show up. And you're saying that that's not the case. If there is a spurious investigation, you know, investigation without merit, proven later or, or whatnot, that doesn't, doesn't trigger this. It's the enforcement action that does. Is that correct? That's what we would recommend on the form, yes. <laughs> yes, I think the, the language that's proposed here is much narrower. Um, or better defined, hopefully, than the than the prior language that was that was being considered. Um, so pre previously, it it didn't specify the the agencies, um, and it was uh, I think broad in in terms of including um, pending um, pending investigations and, and things of that sort. So I think here it's um, more defined as to the types of actions and the types of agencies that would be involved. Okay. No, that's, that's an important point. So that the, the, it sounds like the concerns that were raised on that front um, are no longer valid in the sense that this, that has been narrowed down to be, to be very clear. Is that correct? Yeah. I don't think the CIA would recommend pending investigations because from what we found from looking at these agencies, banks are investigated all the time. And the question is, what is the result of those investigations? Was there really fraud? Was there really predatory lending? Was there really something that was done that was illegal? Again, the definition being, well, did they do something that was illegal? If something was done illegal, we want to know about it. Great. I appreciate that and just wanted to, to clear that up. The other issue that was raised that, that I think could be cleared up has to do with the, the, the difference between requiring a bank to certify under penalty of urgency that it is in compliance with all applicable consumer financial protection versus certifying that the policies and procedures um, are in compliance. It seems potentially could be a distinction without a difference, but, uh, but it may not be, and I wanted to, to get your sense of. So one of the things that we looked at when we re were do redoing the form based on the discussions that were held in committee, um, we added a section on consumer protection on both the investment side as well as on the um, commercial banking side. And one of the things that we asked for was, um, do you have policies to prevent the use of illegal predatory consumer adverse sales go goals as the basis for evaluation, promotion, discipline, or compensation of employees? So the goal would be to have policies. This is in this is in the, on the same level as we ask him for all our other like standard provisions the city asks for on affirmative action or equal opportunity, um, you know, child support. We ask him for copies of their policies to see if they, if what happens when you don't comply, what actions would the bank take if there is a a employee found doing something that is not in accordance with these policies, and that's the type of things that we are asking for in the form as a reflection of the policy of the RBO. Right. Again, I think that the way you explained it, to me, also satisfies, I'll be interested in hearing from the Chamber and others, but it seems like it satisfies that concern. Uh, the two major concerns that are there are satisfied in the way that, that, it's, that you're drafting it, or that, that's being recommended. 
Yeah, and we also ask, um, we, uh, the Office of Finance and CAO looked at all the motions that were passed by council, because there were several motions that were passed, right. and we were asked to look at sales goals, um, predatory, you know, predatory sales goals, um, in compliance with consumer financial protection laws, as well as whistleblower. Uh, we're also asking them for policies, what happens when there's a whistleblower, what kind of actions do they take? because you know, we don't want people to be fired if they are whistleblowers. So do you have policies to protect whistleblowers? Just like I think the Office of Finance mentioned, the city has those type of, of procedures. So we're asking for the same thing as part of the RBO. Great. I appreciate that. I appreciate you being <coughs> responsive to the different concerns that were raised. Um, last question about the investment banks. Are they... Are they captured in this net as well, or, or how do we? Yeah, I. <laughs> I raised this last time because you know some of these guys are the ones who put us into this financial crisis. And... Yeah, I, I, we're we're including the same language. Um, you know, a lot of the firms that we deal with on the investment side, investment banking side, which is the side that the CAO deals with mainly, which are the underwriters. Some of them are big banks. Some of them are are. All they do is tra are traders, right? They're broker dealers. But we believe that the policies should probably be the same, right? Because if they're doing something illegal on that side also, they should have policies that would address those issues. So we also added it to the investment banking form. So we're treating both sides equally. I don't know if Todd wants to add to anything. No, that's, that's my understanding. Very helpful. Thank you. Members? Mr. Kress? I think I'm good. Okay. Um, okay, so um, I th think we... The amendments that you just discussed a minute ago, I'm not sure if they're set forth uh, in these recommend... Uh, in what we have before us. Um, I know that... So basically, we would recommend working with the city attorney's office to add subsections to the RBO that deal with um, disclosure in 10 days of any enforcement action that's taken against them, okay. orders, findings, or settlements by federal all the agencies that we that we um, mentioned here. Okay. Um, we would request um, that we be instructed to add a, a paragraph that talks about illegal predatory consumer adverse practices that are not used as a basis for compensation, promotion, or discipline, and um, that anything that is illegal or predatory um, that we found by these government agencies or by a court of law. Um, I know there's been a lot of discussion about what the word predatory means, and I think that both the Office of Finance and CAO feel that's city attorney needs to help us with that because I'm not sure legally how that's enforceable or not. We know that illegal is okay, predatory, I think I think we can work with the city attorney on that. And then um, also to make sure that the RBO, that the any RFP that we issue um, has a lower um, evaluation scores for financial institutions that have violated these consumer laws and have had these illegal actions taken against them. That kind of reflects what came out of the right. RFP for banking. Mm -hmm. So we would request that those type of things be added to what's currently requested in the RBO. All right. So with those additional uh, amendments, members, uh, is there any further discussion or questions? So we're, we're, are, are we going to forward this to council or are we going to... There were the other considerations we discussed to include in the, the RBO from the, the last discussion about the community investment plans and the disclosures. How do we get those in? Uh, yeah, and um, again, so, I invite your, your suggestion on how, whether it should be dealt with by separate motion, mm -hmm. whether you would like to ask for a report back on that to this committee while we advance the rest of the RBO uh, changes. I, I, 
my concern is I just don't want this to continue to sit in this committee. Mm -hmm. So, but however you feel um, we can best address that, I, I'd welcome your your thoughts. Uh, well, on the community investment plan, uh, I'd want to do that right, and so I'd want to consult with uh, Mr. Harris Dawson and I others agree. about how to how to structure that properly. Yeah. Um, so. Um, Perhaps as a separate motion, that would be the way to go, and I'll talk to Mr. Harris Dawson about that. In terms of the uh, the disclosure requirement um, for uh, 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 lending practices or, or, or for um, uh, sales goals, uh, I'm wondering if um, uh, staff couldn't prepare something for us for consideration by the time this gets to council. I think it's a discussion with city attorney. We've talked a little bit. Um, I think our concern is what exactly we'd be asking, the proprietary nature of that. I know in the past when you ask people how they do business very specifically, they may consider that proprietary. We're just not clear on how, how at what level we have to be at to ask that, and we don't want to do anything that banks would say, well, we're not going to respond to that because we feel that's proprietary. So I think we need to work with the city attorney to see what is and what isn't proprietary. You know, we know from our RFPs before that anything dealing with employees, right, is considered proprietary. If they're private banks and not public banks, there's certain rules dealing with that. So, and this is like federal SEC type of rules. Yeah, so I mean, there's two ways to look it. at it. One is that it's mm -hmm. dealing with employees. The other is it's dealing with the public and the people Correct. that the employees are dealing with. Um, you know, there. So, so I think there's there's a couple ways of looking at it. Is there a way to have that report and that option available to us uh, when this comes to council? I think um, the uh, the three items that uh, that Natalie mentioned um, those were all those are all also kind of parallel with the RFP and so city attorney has kind of vetted those um, items I think reasonably well when it comes to um, what we're asking for in terms of enforcement actions and um, illegal activities and um, and the scoring component um, but I think uh, the city attorney hasn't had a chance yet to to vet this with regard to the sales goals, specifically the disclosure element, um, as I imagine it m might take a little, a little bit longer, possibly. I don't, I can't speak for them completely, but uh, uh, usually it takes a little bit of back and forth um, that's occurring and, and some research that they're doing um, in order to come back with um, with legal advice. So it may take a little bit longer. The community investment plan. I don't see that as necessarily a problem because you're asking them how are you going to invest in the communities in the future? And most banks, you know, I think most companies in general so kind of know that. It's not a question of whether it burdens them on them. I think to Mr. Bonin's point, it's how do we assess that? What kind of yeah. oversight do we give to that? Do we want to set up a separate commission, a citizen's <clears throat> advisory board or something that evaluates it? That's the harder part of how, how we mm -hmm. implement it. Yeah, so I'll, I'll work with Mr. Harris Dawson and, and maybe do a pr proposal on that as a motion. On, on this, if, if staff could do the work, perhaps Mr. Koretz and I could propose an amending motion when it gets to council. I think that makes good the, sense. If the work is if it done, doesn't turn out as we'd hoped. Yeah. I think that makes okay. good sense. Why don't we do that so that that way at least we can move the body of it forward. Yeah. The, the motion could be considered at the same time or if it doesn't meet with, you know, what you want to achieve or if, you know, others disagree or if there's a legal issue or whatever, we could even consider that as a separate matter yeah. independently. It doesn't, right. there's, there's no need to get it all done at once. but. But let's move this forward and get it off off of our plate anyway. So, um, I think that's that makes sense to me. Is that mm -hmm. good with you, Mr. Kretz? Yeah. Any other objections, thoughts? Um, if there are none, it will be the action of the committee to um, approve the uh, amendments uh, with the amendments as uh, just recommended by Ms. Brill, um, and then uh, with the request that um, finance work with the CAO and the city attorney uh, with regard to the other suggestions that Mr. Kretz and Mr. Bonin have raised. Were there any others that 
Oh, you guys had to. Okay. So does that make sense? We good? All right. So. If there's no objection, that will be the action of the committee. Thank you all very much. Uh, we have to proceed now into our closed session items. So thank you all for coming down. See you next time. Thank you. All right. Have a good day. Uh, All right. Um, we uh, the only matter remaining on the agenda is public comment. I have no public comment cards. Uh, Mr. Williams, are there any public comment cards other than no other members cards? Members of the public who have left. Um, all right. Well, then, is there any other business before the committee? Uh, no, sir.